Welcome to All About Money on HK IBC. I'm Chloe Fen. China's economic growth is facing headwinds in the wake of the debt crisis, gripping the property sector and local governments, as well as weak market sentiment amid regulatory uncertainties. Many economies and financial institutions have downgraded China's outlook. But others are convinced that the world's second largest economy will bounce back and is still investable. So why are they confident and what opportunities are there as growth slows? We're now joined by Steve Ellen Lawrence, Chief Investment Officer at Belfort Capital Group, to tell us why he's still betting on China's markets and economic potential. Belfort Capital Group is a research and advisory firm for institutional money managers and investors. And Steve has over 30 years' experience in the financial markets. So, Steve, it's great to have you today, and thank you for joining us from Spain. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, speaking to you. I'm uh, hosting an investor conference here uh, for my employees and uh, institutional investors. So I'm really uh, fortunate to speak to you about these uh, opportunities in China. All right. First thing first, tell us why are you still optimistic about China's economic growth when, at a time when many economies have downgraded the country's outlook? And uh, how are you assessing China's new growth pattern now, where we could possibly see something like 3 to 4 percent growth in the coming years? I think that's a fantastic question and a very realistic question. The reality is that assessing value is based on three different components. The first is what the asset class is. The second is when you see such hyper growth, uh, exponential growth in a country like China over the last two decades, uh, it's common that there will be a trough. And the reality is that they're still growing faster than everyone else, and they will continue based on their intellectual capital, but more importantly, their global diversification. And that's what I see there, a, a real opportunity for the long term. All right, but Steve, compare with the previous growth, let's say, for example, in the 90s, 20s, we're seeing something like 10 to 20 percent growth in China. And now compare with that time, the growth have significantly declined. And uh, what do you think China's growth will be like, for example, in this year and next year, uh, especially when next year, if we see something like slower growth next year, what does it also mean for China's economic growth uh, in the coming, in the, in the future? It, you know, I see the growth rate being about three and a half to four percent, OK? But it's irrelevant, in my opinion, when you're looking at that market long term, because what you're looking for right now is true value of quality companies, which there are, and quality, and quality intellectual horsepower within the, within the human capital of the workforce there. And that's what you have in China. You have world-class technology. You have a lot of well-educated intellectual consumers. And you're still seeing growth. You have to understand, it, it, it's a very large population. All right. So the numbers will always justify the means at the end. Speaking of the headwinds for now, we've had, for example, the high youth jobless rates, as you earlier also mentioned. I mean, we also mm. have a declining population. Then how do you, you know, assess such risks? The way I look, you know, what, what I do understand is this. When you have a, a higher unemployment rate with youth, multinational companies and companies all over the world, all right, will find that to be an, opp an opportunity to capture excellent human capital and intellectual horsepower. Once the trade winds calm down, and they will, okay, time tends to heal everything. It's actually an advantage for people who actually know what they're doing, because you're going to have an opportunity to really capture some excellent uh, long-term employees. And that's what you need to look for when you're growing any type of company in anywhere in the world. The world is transparent today. It's truly a global economy. People just need to adjust to the new normal. So this is an opportunity for foreign investments to come in, to expand in China, and also to maybe take the advantage of you know, local uh, workforce market as well. But uh, speaking of the, for example, earlier US Commerce Secretary uh, Gina Raimondo, after she visited China and also assessed the situation there, she also said that American firms have complained that China has become increasingly more uninvestable. What are your clients thinking about whether or not they want to be in China? 
I'm not a politician, but what I can say to you is, is that um, the, the, the titans of industry have already met in China. So uh, it's not if people want to do business there, it's how they're going to do business there and execute. All right. So that's just, uh, you know, saber rattling by two sides and trying to get an adjustment of where, where, where people can create value. So I firmly believe, and I disagree with her policy there, but you know, I believe that it is an opportunity. And I also believe there are, there are institutions like CICC who are actively trying to find institutions like myself to do business with. And they've got world-class systems, world-class service. So I think the door is wide open. All right, let's not it's take an it. advantage. Let's talk about the pain point for now for the country, especially on its property sector. Uh, China is now transitioning from the credit field growth to m now more value-added growth. And uh, since China implemented the three red line policy, we have the property crisis uh, being unfolded as well, starting from the Evergrande, and now we also have the another de developer, major developer, Country Garden, that is facing potential default. Is, where mm -hmm. are we now amid this crisis? Do you think we're seeing the bottom yet, or uh, actually the crisis, the crisis could deepen later on? I, this is the bottom, okay? But it's more than just the bottom, okay? What you need to—I think what the public needs to understand, the public has a very short-term memory. I mean, you've seen those type of crises of the United States and other property markets all over the world. What tends to happen sometimes is that— uh, people can embellish on a story and it's actually an opportunity for bond buyers okay to step into the market but you have to be very smart and very nimble okay and that is the reality but speaking of uh, such issue because china's intention is good to want to you know manage the financial risk from such high leverage issue from the property developers but then we also we are struck by COVID, and then we have the high inflation overseas that also limited the export. So all these things together are kind of like suffocating China's growth. Then how long do you think such a downturn could last before the market could bounce back, for example, in the property sector? The market will bounce back in the property sector within the next two to three years, possibly even sooner. OK, it may not attain those long level, the lofty levels that they had before, but over the long term, they will. Um, you know, I need to reiterate something that there have been plenty of countries like the, I mean, you go to you go to San Francisco, they're having worse problems. OK. All right. Uh, when it comes to property, property is a very, very delicate long term investment. And it has to be in right now what you're seeing in the U.S., you've got people like Barry Stern like, that are putting together distress debt funds because the tsunami is just about ready to happen in various in, in, in various sectors in the property market globally. So it's going through a cycle uh, and the default rate, anything to do with defaults, there is always a way to work out a payment. OK, so the duration for that payment will be longer and the stronger underwriting guidelines actually helps the consumer and helps the bank, all right? All right, so the consumer inherently needs to be deleveraged, and that's how you do it. And you do it by having tougher underwriting guidelines. We've seen when you don't have the proper underwriting guidelines, you see what can happen. You saw what happened in the United States, okay? And the mortgage crisis. So it's somewhat similar, but really not. But what about the structural change in the supply and demand? side because now we do have exceeding uh, housing supplies in the market, isn't it? So how could we really consume those uh, finished and unfinished projects? And do you think there will still be enough demand to really absorb all of those exceeding su exceeded supplies? Absolutely. OK, because when there's an excess supply, all right, and the country has a population of that size, it's just a matter of finding the right value for the borrower, all right, to get in. The developer, he may have to take it on the chin a little bit, but he's going to have to deal with that, all right? But it's an absolute opportunity, all right, for the middle class to attain good long-term properties for themselves and actually in, in establish their family and their growth pattern. So I think it's an opportunity. And I assure you, OK, with a lot of conviction, that it is probably the buy of the century. 
that's how convinced I am. Wow. And speaking of uh, the foreign investor, they're hoping for more tangible actions from Beijing to prop up the markets. And there have been some bit-by-bit uh, -bit adjustments, isn't it? We were, we were seeing some stimulus measures over the past weeks, sometimes even on a daily basis. So we also have uh, the, the lowering down, uh, down payment ratio that, were, that was set on a nationwide level. And would you... Uh, would you, for example, expect there will be more stimulus measures coming out from Beijing to prop up this market? And how would you assess authorities' approach? Because many people are awaiting for something like the bazooka-ish style uh, stimulus, but we're not seeing that. You know, I, I, and I, I, the bazooka-style stimulus is only a short-term fix, okay, in my humble opinion. OK, what I believe is that you have to do stimulus slowly and methodically. Yeah, it, it's a market. It has to play out. OK, it, it, that's the only way you'll find true value in any asset class. All right. And I think that, you know, the, the public is being a little tough on the stimulus over there, but they don't understand that they're actually doing the right thing, which is allowing it to do, be done slowly and methodically, because they need to see how it all plays out. And that's how you're going to get really good institutional investors to come in, all right, and buy up and play for the long term, global pension funds. And that's where you're going to see the hand-in-hand -hand relationship over time between the United States and China and the rest of the world. It makes sense. But how would you, uh, for example, interpret the market reactions uh, recently, because those small adjustments seem to be not sustaining the market rallies. Uh, well, let me say this to you. Obviously, on a day like today, you saw uh, Evergrande, you know, up 70 percent. It's not about the market rally, okay? When a market rallies over the long term, it really takes time to develop a base. Nothing goes up in a straight line, and it shouldn't go up in a straight line, all right? So w in this type of situation, You'll have to be a patient investor, and you'll have to be a diligent investor. And you'll see the divergence between the Hang Seng and the Dow Jones will come into line soon. All right. Uh, we'll take a short break for now, but coming up next, we'll discuss more about the foreign investments in China, as well as the latest geopolitical dynamics. So do stay tuned. Welcome back to All About Money on HKIBC. I'm Chloe Feng. Joining us today is Steve Allen Lawrence, Chief Investment Officer at Belfort Capital Group, which is a research and advisory firm for institutional money managers and investors. So, Steve, it's great to have you today. Earlier, you talked about how you know you see potential there in China, uh, despite the downturns or despite the uh, seemingly lower growth patterns. But tell us more. Which sectors, which sectors do you exactly see potential there? In other words, what kind of industries would you bet on, would you bet more in China? Uh, technology. Technology, chips. Uh, I, the technology sector there is just in its short-term infancy. Okay, so I see the technology sector, and I also see the hospitality sector uh, being a tremendous sign of long-term growth there. The technology sector is, first of all, they're very strong inherently, and they have a proven track record, all right? And, and, and multinationals do feel comfortable, all right, with their product design. And like anything else, okay, as, a, as an industry matures, all right, the quality of work gets better and more efficient. And that's what you're seeing there with companies like Apple and Tesla, all right? They rely on high quality work, and you haven't been able to see that in other uh, parts of the world. They're way ahead in a lot of in those factors, all right. And there's a lot of ingenuity that's coming out of China, without question. Uh, for example, lately we'll be seeing like some Chinese companies they are able to produce seven nanometer chips with the global capital being poured in the U.S. stocks, for example, for uh, some AI companies and NVIDIA, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. then are there like any specific companies that you will bet, uh, that you will bet in China then? Um, it, 
In, in general, there are a few tech funds that I would look at. Uh, I would think that, you know, obviously the ants, the Alibabas, I consider them technology companies. All right. The TMCs, like, you know, that's the sector I'd be looking at specifically. All right. As an overall index, I look at the overall index. So I just I'm very, very bullish on the entire hang saying at these levels. I think you'll never see 17,500 ever again. OK, and I think the Hang Seng will uh, retrace back to normal levels of 21, 22,000. So I think it's a it, it's a golden opportunity. We will talk more about Hang Seng Index later on. But before mm -hmm. that, you also mentioned about the hospitality sector. Why is that? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, the world is curious always about traveling, and there are so many amazing. Macaw is, you know, it's it's incredible what they've done out there, and I think that's just going to be one of many places over the next decade. All right, that are going to be established throughout China. All right, and the world likes to travel. There's no doubt about it. Okay, and and the Chinese know how to put it together very nicely and give a nice global experience. And as that opens up, hospitality is going to boom, not only on the local market, okay, but on the global market there. Now, just uh, this Monday, China's uh, economic planner, the National Development and Reform Commission, also said that it will create a new bureau to revive the private sector's growth. Uh, how do you see these departments like being set up? Do you think this will be uh, very helpful in terms of boosting its private economy? Absolutely. You're going to always have to work with the government locally, hand in hand, uh, up to a certain extent. All right. But the reality is that private investors, private institutions, all right, want the ability to just be on a fair playing field. So I think both parties really need each other to really develop long term systemic growth. OK, there'll always be some bumps in the road, but that's in every economy. And, and I think that's what people are missing in China right now, that there's still growth. They're just been spoiled by exponential growth. But and uh, I, I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, but there's a certain concerns, for example, the regulatory uh, crackdowns that we've seen over the past years on the tech, on the education sectors. Wouldn't such issues concern you at some level? Well, I think that when when a system is developing more and showing more growth, there's always going to be a regulatory framework, okay? And regulators always have a, a way of uh, making things confusing, all right? But the reality is that when an economy right now is in a downturn, they'll always find a way, all right, to make things on an even playing field because it's advantageous for the country, okay? Overregulation is an Achilles to, to many uh, industries. All right. But at the same time, the, they always seem to find a way to make things work out. So it's a tough call and it's a very difficult question you're asking. Now, we are seeing the declining foreign direct investments in China. And if there's also some concerns, for example, investors are having a sort of like a promise fatigue. Uh, they're seeing China promising that they will issue more uh, welcoming measures to woo the investors. But then at the same time, we've seen the, for example, anti-espionage campaigns uh, over the past months, earlier this year as well. Then how would you balance, you know, this sort of, uh, in, some, in, in some measures that can be considered as self-conflictory? The way I measure it is like this, okay? If you're seeing value, and I believe there's tremendous value there, that's the risk that you need to take. OK, in any in any investment, OK, buyer always has to be, be beware. All right. I believe it is a perfect storm. All right. To go into China right now. And when you're coming in on this trough right here, you could be at the right place at the right time. You have to create your timing when you see value. And I see tremendous value, tremendous long term growth and incredible intellectual horsepower there. What? Um, what are the other measures that you would like to see or the steps by Beijing that probably will, you know, promote uh, or uh, welcome foreign investors in a more efficient way or like to attract foreign investors in a more effective way? Well, I could tell you that you can talk to banks like CICC and they're welcoming, welcoming firms like us and want to do business with us with great service and, and good people. All right, so that's what I see in that. I mean, as far as the policies of Beijing, I'm not a politician. 
All right, but what I am, all right, is a logical investor, and two parties will always find a way to negotiate a transaction that makes sense. So I, I you know, I believe that they'll give you all the opportunities you want out there, but you've just got to play in the right sandbox. Uh, speaking of other markets, for example, in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong's stock market was actually one of the worst performers in the world this year. Why do you see that uh, there is a possibility or opportunities from, uh, from this downturn as well? Because markets go in cycles, okay? And markets go up and markets go down. And the key to being any investor is to find what you perceive value. All right, and I believe that there's value here and substantial value here. And that divergence between the US markets and the Chinese markets, they will balance. It's just how and when, all right? So when you have a, a little bit of a long-term horizon, all right, this is the opportunity, okay? You're gonna have to be patient, but not that patient, because these numbers may not be here anymore, okay? You may never see 17,500 on the Hang Seng ever again. All right, but you're going to be very sad when you see it at 23,000 and you could have owned it at 18,000. But if we compare with the patterns in the past uh, in the Hang Seng Index, we are seeing the level now is actually very similar to the 2008 and 2007 when we are seeing the financial crisis back then, right? So uh, how, how do we like reconcile with the market status then? Do you see, you see that there will be room for growth then? How long would it take for, for the Hang Seng Index, for example, to bounce back to the 22 or 23 thousand level? You know, in my opinion, you'll see 21, 22,000 within the next uh, eight to 10 months, if not higher. Speaking of geopolitical tensions that we've seen recently, for example, President Xi Jinping will not attend the G20 summit in India. And uh, uh, in the past, we we're expecting President Biden could meet President Xi in the G20 summit. Then, but now, when Xi, President Xi Jinping is not attending the summit, then we're not really sure when the meeting can take place between the world's two most powerful leaders. And how will this change also affect the latest geopolitical dynamics? The U.S.-China tensions will ease. I mean, you know, as far as the G20 and all those geopolitical events, um, it's right now it's about a competitive advantage in business, okay? And that's what I truly believe, all right? I truly believe that it's it, the geopolitical events right now is about balance, okay? And everyone's looking for the right transaction for everyone's economy. And I think the reason why he didn't go, if I were to speculate, is it's competition, you know? and let the chips fall where the chips fall. And that's my personal belief on that, you know? That is my personal belief. And I assure you, uh, in my mind, that uh, China, the United States, will be holding hands, because they have to. So it all comes back down to value and who can procure the larger client to extend long-term growth. Things just have to just balance, okay, because the markets are volatile right now, and, and but it's the beginning of the volatility, and when you see this type of volatility, you see an advantage, and that's the key to investing. Sometimes the best opportunities, all right, is when the markets are at their lowest or toughest points to invest in, historically. All right. Thank you very much for your thoughts. That's Steve Alain Lawrence. Chief Investment Officer at Belfour Capital Group. And thank you for watching All About Money. We'll be back next Sunday night. So until the next time, please take care.